Our gospel this day comes to us from the 14th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Last week, you know, we heard the story about Jesus who, had, upon hearing his cousin's murder, his political murder of John the Baptist, his execution, he wanted to get away. And so he left his disciples, he left the crowds, took a boat, went across the Sea of Galilee to try to get away, and it didn't work. But out of compassion, he healed the sick that were amongst the people. And then there was the feeding of the 5,000 men, plus women and children. You give them something to eat. This is how the story continues. Now immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. There's a story of you know, a lady who, while at her monthly appointment with her hairdresser, was asked if she had any plans She said, yes, she and her husband were going to take a long-awaited trip to the Eternal City. They were going to go to Rome. The the hairdresser was like, Rome? Really? It's crowded? It's dirty? Really? Why would you go there? Well, so how are you getting there? Oh, we're flying. What carrier? American? Oh, we got to get... American? Their planes are old, they're too cramped, the flight attendants are unfriendly, you know, they're always late. So, really, where, so what are you gonna, where are you going to stay in Rome? It's like, oh, we found this exclusive little place near the river called Test. Oh, don't go any further. I know that place. Everyone thinks it's this nice little special and exclusive joint, but it's a dump. We're going to go to the Vatican and... Maybe see the Pope. (laughs) Yeah, sure. You and five million other people, the Pope's going to be the size of an ant to you. Well, a month later for her next monthly appointment, that woman was back in the hairdresser's chair. Hairdresser said, so, did you go to Rome? Yep. How was your trip? It was amazing. We were on one of the new planes. It was on time. They overbooked. They moved us into first class. It was amazing. Well, what about the hotel? Well, they had just finished this massive remodel. They had overbooked, and we got a suite at no extra charge. Okay, but, you know, but I was right about not getting within a mile of the Pope, right? It's like, no, actually it was amazing. As my husband and I were on one of the tours of the Vatican, a Swiss guardsman tapped me on the shoulder and, and offered if we would like to see, meet the Pope because he liked to meet with some of the small groups of some of the visitors to the Vatican. So I got to meet the Pope. I got to shake his hand. And as I knelt, he blessed me and he said things to me. Really, what did the Pope say to you? Who screwed up your hair? Do 
Do you know that there are some people in the world that should be invited to move to the desert because they will rain on your parade no matter what it may look like? You know, Saturday Night Live had Debbie Downer as a recurring character. Wah, wah, wah. There are some of those people that are just out there who, I mean, <laughs> it's not that the glass is half empty, but the glass broke and spilled all over the floor and they cut themselves on the glass. I mean, there are just sometimes that happens. But there are some people who expect it to happen. And there are some people that just want to tell you how awful it's going to be. What would have happened to that woman on her trip to Rome if she took what the hairdresser said to heart? What would have happened to her trip if the hairdresser's words prejudiced her against her experience before she even went? Would she have had as much fun? Would she have thought it was as amazing? Now, granted, in the joke, there's a lot of hyperbole of the opposite. You know, you got upgraded to first class international. Oh, my. If you ever can do that, that's amazing. I only have two kidneys. I can't afford to do it. You know, but it's amazing. You know, what would have happened if the hotel hadn't? What would have happened if they just had a regular tour of the Vatican? Would... The hairdresser's words have stolen some of the joy in the experience because she went on this trip expecting it to be bad. We often like to say, seeing is believing. Because this woman could have gone on this trip, had this wonderful time, and even if the hair, with the harsh words of the hairdresser echoing in her head that you know, she was just gonna, you know, she was going to eventually get there and with these experiences go, wow, this was amazing still. But let's be honest. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. We often will only see what we expect ourselves to see. We will only allow ourselves to see what we want to see. We can often just decide, here's the limits, because that's all you expect. And you close yourself off to everything else. Believing is seeing. Case in point. This past week, I had two very different conversations with two different people, one day apart. The topic was the grandeur of nature. It was almost freaky about the two different people talking about how they would see the mountains and the lakes and the trees and everything else. And one of them said to me, how can you see all this and not believe in God? 24 hours later, another person said, look at all of this. This is my God. had the same experience, saw the same things. But their acceptance, what they saw, what they believed. We have a thing called confirmation bias. We often look for the things that reinforce what we already believe. Believing is seeing. And the, God, the lessons today, the First Testament lesson and the Gospel lesson today, both come to us and remind us that no, there's always something more. Monty Python's song, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. When you close your eyes for that last time, Know that you will see again, with God will, you will be greeted there with just one more surprise. 
God reminds us that there's something more. And this is where we start running into the issues of faith. Faith? Faith? Yes, faith. Which, I want to be clear on, is not the same as belief. I believe I will have a nice beer at Pint with a Pastor. That doesn't make a hill of beans to anything else other than that experience. Faith will draw you beyond that which you can believe or accept. Look at Elijah. Elijah is on the run. He's basically been declared an outlaw of the kingdom. He is being hunted down. In fact, just the paragraphs before the one we read, he tells the angel of the Lord, just let me die. And God feeds him. And he keeps going. And he gets to this place where the commandments were given, where there was all of the lights and the flame and everything else like that when the Israelites received the commandments. And he's told, the Lord will pass by. And what happens? There's the mighty wind that breaks rocks. Nope, not God. There's an earthquake. Nope, not God. There's a big consuming fire. The pillar of flame? Not God. The sound of sheer silence. No offense, that's one of those translations that's a head scratcher for me. How does sheer silence have a sound? But Simon and Garfunkel sang a song about it, so it's all right. If Elijah operated with what his previous knowledge was, what his beliefs of the power, immensity, and majesty of God was like, he could have walked out in the middle of the wind and been ripped to pieces. He could have been shaken down by the earthquake. He could have been consumed in the fire. Fundamentally, that God was more than any of those things. He had faith that God was more than what God had revealed, what he knew, what he understood. And so even in the absolute opposite of what his existence had been like, where it was chaos and ruin and running, sheer silence. He knew that God was there. Peter and the disciples are in a boat, in a storm, without Jesus rocking the boat. There's another classic song right there. Rock the boat, to rock the boat, rock the boat, tip the boat over. Okay, there's a reason I'm not in the choir. Come on. Actually, that song's more about love than it is about what Peter's doing, but, you know. They're in a boat without Jesus, and they are in this windstorm. They are in the dark. It's not looking good for them. They're in this one device that's meant to be a designed to transport them safely over the water. And they're not too sure about that. And then in the darkness they see someone walking on this water. No wonder they're terrified. They're already scared. And something happens that does not fit their preconceived notions. This is not how things happen. And they cry out. And Jesus responds, Do not be afraid. It is I. Just for the record, that is one of the 365 times an angel, the Lord, Jesus, or some other heavenly being gives the command to us to not be afraid. It's almost as if God knows what we tend to run towards. Fear. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. 
Now, Peter, Peter, the great rockhead, Peter, the guy who would rush in where angels fear to tread, Peter, the guy who could say something of intense faith and belief and shows that he's got it, and 10 seconds later act like a complete and total twit. You're the Messiah, but no, you can't die. He goes from, you are the rock upon which I'm building my church to get behind me, Satan, in about three verses. This is Peter. And yet Peter still goes, if it is you, command me to go out. Peter, the fisherman, Peter, the man who knows boats, who understands most intimately that you don't get out of the boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee unless you're a real good swimmer. Or as Bill Cosby said, how long can you tread water? Call me and I will go. His belief, his knowledge would have led him to say, that is stupid. Yet faith allowed him to get out of the boat. And he did. And he got out and he walked. And then he started paying attention too much again to what was going on around him. And he sank. But he still cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus did. And lift him up. Even in his terror, he knew God was going to save him. Even in this extreme position that was completely and totally unnatural, he knew God would protect him. That's not knowledge. That's faith. That's trust. And that's what comes to us. Elijah had to have faith that God was more than the destruction and violence that he was experiencing. Peter was looking for something that was beyond what he could understand. Believing. Seeing. But Peter gets out. He walks on the water for a little bit. He sinks, yes, but then Jesus pulls him up. What are the other 11 disciples doing? They're still hanging out in the boat, aren't they? <laughs> yep. You know, this past week I had a long conversation with someone, very surprisingly, and eh, not, because I hear it a lot who was struggling with a great deal over the question, did they have enough faith? Enough faith. Good God. Do you have enough faith? And I looked at them and I said, I know I don't. I know I don't. If it's about how much I have faith, if it's about how much I believe, it's about how much I know, if it's about how much I do, I would sink to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. I would have stepped out in that windstorm and been taken apart. I would have been roasted up on that big flame. I would have been thrown down by that earthquake. If it was entirely about what I knew and what I experienced and what I believed... If I'm saved by the amount of faith I have, I'm going to have to ask God if there's a preferred barbecue rub in hell so I at least can start prepping myself properly. But again, those 11 disciples were sitting in the boat watching Peter and never got out. What did Jesus do with Peter after he lifted him up? Did he just keep walking across the Sea of Galilee? No, he got in the boat. He went to them. 
as God went to Elijah on that mountain, as Jesus had compassion on the crowds and healed their sick and fed them, as he, in the terror of their, his own disciples, he called out for them not to be afraid, showed them that they had no reason to, and yet still joined them in the boat. God comes to us not because of our faith, not because of what we do. God comes to us because this is what God does. We call it grace. And this grace, the generosity, reaching out, advocacy, compassion, and encouragement, notice that is what Jesus did exactly to us. He gave of everything of who he was for us. He reached out to us, to the world on the cross. He advocated, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing on the cross. He had compassion on the masses and fed them and healed them. And he encouraged us. us that we are to go out into the world baptizing and teaching. Why? Because he will be with us till the end of the age. All of these things come to us, not because we get it, not because we understand it, not because we always see it and cling to it, but because we need it. This gift of grace, this gift of love, is a gift that comes to us because Jesus has faith. And he gives it to us because that's what he does. My hope and my prayer is that we see and we feel this So that all of the negativity and the nastiness and stuff like that that this world seems to like want to bombard us with and cause us to look at the rest of the world, our world, our neighbors, anybody else, even God, in negative terms because of all the negativity that comes to us, may we in grace receive some, shall we say, some BS filters. For the record, that stands for Bible study just in case some of you were thinking of something else. You can tell me about it afterwards. We'll call it confession. But that we can then have that, receive that gift of faith that allows us to look beyond, to see a future with hope, to know the love of God that surpasses everything. Everything that beats even the boundaries of death itself. And in that, the peace that surpasses all understanding be with us, now and always. Not because we deserve it, not because we earn it, but because we need it. And God knows it. And so I invite you to remind yourself of the promises of God given to you in baptism. You repeat after me. These are the promises God gave you in baptism. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I've been marked with the cross of Christ forever. I am Christ's. And that's a gift. And that's what was given. And so may we remember, may we know And that way we may know and remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen.